This time of year, of course, is the harvest time. Many <clears throat> parts of the country have already finished their harvest. In our part of the country, of course, the fruit has all been brought in now, safely stored in the warehouse, some of it going out to be sold in various parts of the country and of the world. As we, Phyllis and I, traveled south into California, we noticed that most of the harvest had been gathered in of the various crops. Of course, California, we drove through the Sacramento Valley. We saw there the rich farmlands and the various kinds of things that are grown there. We went through beautiful olive groves, almond groves, and all of those things that are so important as part of their harvest, part of their agricultural life. The Word of God speaks much about the harvest. Of course, not speaking of a harvest of plants, but a harvest of people, a harvest of souls. Jesus, in this famous passage that we read from Matthew, speaks about the harvest. And he is talking about people. I'd like to look again at that passage in Matthew 9. Because we see that the Lord is, as the great harvester, looks out upon the harvest and sees it with great compassion. And that's the word that is used here. It says, when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep, having no shepherd. We have first the idea of, of sheep, which are taken care of by the shepherd, and they are a harvest of sorts because, and we saw many sheep in California, by the way, it were beautiful areas for sheep growing, the sheep out on the hillsides, and the wool would be taken and harvested from the sheep, later on, and made into wool, suits and dresses and clothing and blankets and all of those things. But he also speaks about a harvest here using the imagery of plants, of crops, and he says that harvest is plenteous. There's a lot out there to be brought in. But he says the laborers are few. As we look out on the field today, the harvest of the Lord, the harvest of people that need to be brought to the knowledge of Jesus, the knowledge of his kingdom, the knowledge of the future that he has provided and planned for us, we see, unfortunately, that still the case is that is in comparison with the vast numbers all over the earth who need to be brought in, to the knowledge and into the family of the Lord, the laborers still are few. As the Lord looked out upon the people who were milling about, who seemed like sheep without a shepherd, who seemed not to know where to go, of course we are told that sheep are a kind of animal that desperately needs constant guidance, they mill about with uncertainty, without security, unless there is a shepherd to watch over them. And in a land like Palestine, where the Lord lived at that time, there were wild animals that attacked the sheep. There were wolves. There were even lions at one time there, we're told. And these, animal, these sheep were subject to the attack of these animals of prey, unless the shepherd were able to protect them from that. Jesus speaks as one who is pictured here uh, having great compassion. The word compassion literally means to feel with someone, to feel what they are feeling, to put yourself in their shoes, so to speak. It means that you understand their condition, their need. 
and you feel a sense of pity or love or concern and care for those people. When we think about evangelism, when we think about reaching out to other people, it seems that we can never think of it, if we're going to be Christ-like, think of it in terms simply of a business, you know, business you sit down and you calculate facts and figures and you plan simply from the standpoint of so much profit, so much gain, so much loss, and so on. It cannot be from that standpoint. Because we are thinking in terms of human lives. I've read sometimes that doctors get after their fellow doctors. They say, well, we simply cannot think in terms of remedies, in terms of treatments, in terms of so many patients seen and dealt with, but we have to think in terms of lives, human lives, human personalities, individuals who are there before us. I suppose that's what makes the difference between a good bedside manner and a poor one. We know some doctors who treat their patients with great concern. When you go in there, you know that that, per that doctor cares. He's concerned. It's not just you're another person to be seen and we'll get rid of you as soon as we can. Well, evangelism is that way too. Because Jesus was the compassionate shepherd. He cared and cares for the needy sheep who need to be brought in and taken care of. Christ was not simply there to wring his hands over the situation, but he was prepared to do something about it. When we look out upon the fields that are white unto harvest, as he describes them in John, I suppose we could say that it is a hopeless task. We see millions and even billions of people in the world who know nothing of Jesus, who've never seen a Bible, wouldn't even know what you meant if you mentioned the word Bible to them. And we could say, well, we can't do anything, so we, or we can do very little, so let's not do anything. That would be the temptation, of course. But you'll notice the first thing Jesus says as to what we are to do in verse 37, after he mentions that there's such a great harvest, plenteous, he says, vast, unlimited, perhaps, and that the laborers are few. Notice he doesn't say simply sit down and forget it. First of all, you start with prayer. Pray ye, therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. How many of us have actually prayed earnestly before God and asked him to send out laborers to help bring in that great harvest? Have you ever really done that? Do you do it on any regular basis? You know, it's, it's easy to do once in a while. But do we do it on a regular basis? Do we ask the Lord to send out laborers? That's our first responsibility, apparently, in light of what the compassionate shepherd says here. But it's interesting that once we begin praying about certain things, if we really pray earnestly about those things, pretty soon we feel personally involved, don't we? We feel like we have a share somehow. I remember when I started praying that way that pretty soon I felt like I had to do something about it. I couldn't simply pray. I had to do something that was in accord with my prayers. I think the Lord knew this. I'm sure he did. I'm sure that he knew that if we were going to pray about the harvest and the laborers that are needed to bring the harvest in, that we would feel a need to be involved, either to go ourselves 
or to be personally involved in the sending of others, providing the financial means, the prayer undergirding for them to go and to bring in the harvest. I've heard missionaries talk about how they felt on the foreign field that they felt the prayers of those at home who were praying for them. I think I felt that more in this last trip than I have ever felt it before. While I was down in South America this time, I really felt your prayers. I just could feel them. I knew and felt in a very, kind of an uncanny way, I can't describe it exactly, but I just felt those prayers being offered on my behalf from you and from others in other parts of the country who were praying for me on a very daily, a very sustained, and a very earnest basis. And I appreciated that more than I can tell you. I really felt that undergirding of support that made it possible for me to be there and to see the Lord's hand at work in a marvelous way, in a greater way than I'd ever seen before. And I couldn't feel that I could take any credit for it because the Lord was doing it, and he was doing it in answer to your prayers. To your prayers. Jesus felt a burden here. The word compassion suggests that idea, that feeling. He felt a burden for those people. He cared. We read in the book of Hebrews that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. He hasn't changed. Sitting there at the right hand of the Father, he is not about to give up the compassion that he felt as he walked among people on earth. He feels the same way today. As he looks upon this harvest of this earth and sees the misery and the, des the desperate need that is in this world, he still feels that compassion. Some of us, as we saw on the television about the earthquake scenes, saw the terrible need of some of the people, recognized the misery that there really can be in this earth. There were people there in some of the towns, especially south of San Francisco. We hear a lot about San Francisco. But there are towns south of there that were closer to the center of the earthquake where the people lost their entire homes. They just, home after home was lost. The people are living either in tents or they're living in shelters and they're still living there with hundreds of other people in these shelters and they can't go back to their homes. It's too dangerous. Think of the misery. If you couldn't go back to your home and you, your, all your possessions were there, you had to live in this shelter with just whatever you had, the few possessions you had. Some of those folks, mostly Hispanic folks, are living in tents because they're afraid to go to the shelter. They're afraid that maybe that some of them, some of their people are not yet registered with the immigration. They're afraid that part of the family will be deported, part of the family will be left. They're afraid of that. And so they're afraid to go even to the shelters. They're living under tents. And it's cold in California, believe it or not. At night it gets cold there. And it's getting colder. So there's misery. People are, share, are going through some of this misery. And this is just the physical misery. And yet the Lord is compassionate. And there are people there who feel enough compassion that they're working with those other people who are in such need. They're sharing. <clears throat> Some people went down from our Seattle area, medical people, and are sharing there right now, taking, helping. I'm just using this as an illustration of some of the need 
and the need for those who will help in one way or another. This is a need, even though a physical one, it is a way in which we can show the compassion of our Lord for the needs of others and incidentally share with them the gospel, the spiritual benefit that is in the message of the Lord. I'd like to turn to Galatians, the first chapter. We have here a, an example from Paul's life that I'd like to mention. Paul is reminding the Galatians of his call to be a laborer, one of those few laborers. In verse 15 he says, When it pleased God, who separated me, or who, who set me apart from my mother's womb, from the time of my birth, Paul recognized that God had a purpose in his life even before he knew it, even from the time of his birth. He says, He called me by his grace to reveal his Son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen, among the nations, among the Gentiles. Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Paul is referring to his call as a, an apostle, as a minister, as a preacher of the good news. He said, God set me apart from my birth, but later on he called me by his grace. You remember at the time when Paul was on the Damascus road and Jesus spoke to him in vision? And he said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Why do you persecute me? And of course, he was talking about Saul was persecuting the Christians, the believers. And in doing that, they're doing it to Jesus. You remember in another place the Lord had said in Matthew 25, he said, whenever we do for others, we go to the hospital to visit the sick. We go to the prison to visit the prisoners. Whatever we do. He said, inasmuch as you've done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you've done it to me. You've done it to me. You're doing it to Jesus. And when Saul was persecuting the Christians, he was persecuting Jesus. Isn't that interesting? The Lord is so identified and so involved with his followers that whatever we do, it is as though he is doing it. And whatever we do to others, it is as though we're doing it to him. Think of it that way. It will make a difference in how we serve others and how we deal with others if we realize that that's how we're treating Jesus. Then Paul goes on to say that he did not confer at first with others. The Lord had called him. He tells us that rather he went up to Arabia, in verse 17. He spent some time alone in the desert with the Lord, seeking further enlightenment. That was his first job before he went out. When we pray that the Lord will send out laborers, maybe we're the laborer he's going to send out. You might be the one he sends, one of them. What are you going to do about it? Are you going to prepare for that job? This morning in teaching my Sunday school class, I tried to point out that what we're doing is not simply learning some things for our own knowledge, and that's all right, and that's important. But we're also seeking to learn those matters so that we can share them with other people. We can teach others what we ourselves have learned. It means nothing if we don't share it. Because it's when we start teaching others that we learn it better ourselves. It means more to us. It's very important that we share whatever information we have, especially when it's the gospel information. 
sharing it with others. <clears throat> I'd like to go back to Matthew a moment. That passage that we read in Matthew 9. It's very interesting to look at the very next part of that sec section of Scripture. Remember, there are no chapter divisions in the original text. There aren't even any verse divisions. So Matthew 10, which ma is Matthew 10 for us, is going right on after Jesus says, Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he'll send forth laborers into his harvest. And when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out, to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. And then he names the, the twelve apostles, sends them out. Verse 5, he commands them not to go to the way of the Gentiles. Don't even go to the Samaritans yet. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. In other words, just go to the Jews for now. That was the extent of their commission at this point. And as you go, preach, saying... The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus had spent some time already with these men. They had seen him teaching. They had heard him teaching. They had seen him heal the sick. They would seen him cast out demons. They had seen him raise the dead even. Now he's telling them to go out and do likewise. And as they go, he says, preach the kingdom. Preach the message. Teach the things that I have been teaching. These men, as I say, had had some time with Jesus. They had learned firsthand from him. Now was the time to start sharing. What about us? Are we taking time to learn the Word of God so that we can share it with others? It takes time. We can't do it all in one day. We need to take time to share with one another, first of all, the Word of God and also learn it as we study alone each day and take time with the Lord in His Word, reading, meditating, asking Him, for more understanding, wisdom from above. And then, as we are prepared that way, to start sharing it with those outside who are part of the harvest, who have not yet been harvested for the Lord. Here in John 4, which we also read, we have a wonderful example of the Lord showing the way of harvesting. He meets a woman at a well, a Samaritan woman at that, a woman who is despised by the Jews. She's despised by the Jews, first of all, because she's a Samaritan. And then Jesus' disciples, when she came back, they came back, it says they marveled that she talked with a woman. Uh-oh. Jesus is breaking the rules of etiquette. A man is not supposed to talk to a woman in this way about spiritual things. At least the Jews thought so. You know, the women were second-class citizens spiritually. And even today in the Orthodox synagogue, the woman sits up in the balcony, the men are down below, the women are up there in the balcony. That's their way of doing in the Orthodox synagogue. But Jesus is not above sharing precious spiritual truths with, first of all, a woman, second of all, a Samaritan woman. The Jews despise the Samaritans even worse than the Gentiles. And the Samaritans were closer to the truth than the Gentiles. At least the Samaritans believed in the Pentateuch, they had the first five books of Moses, and they had a temple there on Mount Gerizim in which they claimed to worship the one and only God. They had that much truth anyway. 
But the Jews had no use for them because they figured they were half-breeds. They were a mixture of Hebrews who had intermarried with Gentiles, and they didn't have all the truth of the Old Testament, so we don't have anything to do with the Samaritans. And so the Samaritans reciprocated, said, well, we won't have anything to do with the Jews either. So there. Jesus didn't share any of those attitudes. Here he sits down by the well. The Samaritan woman comes to draw water. He asks her politely, may I have a drink? She was surprised that he, a Jew, would and a man would talk to her and ask for water from her hand, from her utensil. That's a no-no. And right off, he begins to share with her something which leads her to say finally, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. You must be a prophet. And Jesus then begins to talk to her about her spiritual need. His compassion overflows to this woman. And she goes back into her village and she tells all the people, come on out here because there's a man out there who told me all the things I've ever done. You must hear him. So they all run out there to hear him. Meanwhile, his disciples arrive there before the Samaritans do. And they find the woman there, and she runs off then. And then Jesus says to her, to them, about the harvest that's white to be brought in. And he says, I'm calling people to be laborers in my harvest. And you didn't do all the work. The Father did it. He sent out the message first of all. The prophets worked. I'm working, and now you have an opportunity to go out and reap the harvest. And then, after that, these people from the village come out, the Samaritans, because of the woman's testimony, and Jesus begins talking to them, and he stays two more days with them and teaches them. And after he's through, we read that many believed because of his own word, verse 41, and said unto the woman, Now we believe, not because of what you told us, that helped to bring them, first of all, but it wasn't simply because of what she said. But then they go on, but we have heard him for ourselves and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One, the Savior of the world. What a testimony. These people are not even part of Israel. And this Messiah of Israel takes the time to go out into Samaria and share with them some things they didn't eat. he didn't even apparently share with the Jews. Because they realize afterwards that he's not simply the savior of the Jews. They would have accepted that. The Jews would have. But he's the savior of the world. In other words, the Samaritans are saying, he's our savior too. He's our savior. Not just for the Jews, but for everybody. For you and me, too. Praise God. Thank God. But what are we doing about it? What will we do? What can we do? In Luke, the 19th chapter, in one of Jesus' famous parables, <clears throat> in the parable of the nobleman, he says to his servants, and he's, of course, talking about us, <laughs> if we claim to be his servants, he says, occupy till I come. The word occupy literally means do business. Do business till I come. The question is, what business? Is he talking about making money? Is that it? Or just our regular business, whatever it happens to be? Is that it? In the context, the business is the Lord's business. There's a place in the Old Testament where some messengers go out and they're questioned about what they're doing. And they said, the king's business requires haste. The king's business requires haste. Well, brothers and sisters, we are called to do the king's business. 
That's the business Jesus is talking about. And he's the nobleman here. And he has distributed responsibilities to each one of us. And he says, do business till I come. What business are you doing? What are you doing with the time that you have at your disposal before the Lord comes? Because that's what he's talking about, his coming. Are you using it to good advantage? Are you preparing for greater service? What about your time after you get home after work at night? Is it simply flop into rest, watch TV, um, enjoy yourself, whatever your pleasures may be? Or do we take some time to prepare for greater service for the Lord? Learning more of the Word, how to share it with others, how to be an effective witness, and perhaps how to go on the field itself, even the mission field. Maybe there are some young people here whom the Lord would really like to prepare to go out beyond the confines of this region, this state, this country, even out into the foreign field. Are you willing, if he would call you to do that? Are you willing to prepare for that, to learn the language, to learn the customs, to learn the ways of that country or that part of the world? He's calling people to do that. He's not just calling people in other congregations. This congregation is part of the body of Christ. Are there people in this congregation who are being called, if they'd only listen to his voice, to go? Are there? Ask yourselves. You must ask yourself before God whether you are being called in some way greater than you've ever heard the voice before to go and share that message with others. The harvest is plenteous, and the laborers, alas, are few. But they don't have to be as few as they are if we will hear his voice. Verse 38 of John 4, Jesus says, I sent you to reap that whereon ye bestowed no labor. Other men labored, and ye are entered into their labors. But the point is, he says, I sent you. Now it's easy to say that refers only to the twelve. But remember, Jesus says in the Great Commission in Matthew 28, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. I don't see those twelve around now. They are long gone. They fell asleep 2,000 years ago, and they're buried hither and yon and here and there. But the church is still here, and the Great Commission is still in effect. And Jesus has not yet returned, but he says, I'm with you every day, literally, until I come back again, till the end of the age. What are you doing about it? What am I doing about it? What is this congregation doing about it? That's what we have to answer on our knees before God. Because the harvest is plenteous. And sometimes, unfortunately, most of the time, the laborers are few. Father in heaven, we thank you for the wonderful light of Jesus and the gospel. The wonderful light that brightens our darkness and makes life worth living. Because we look forward to the day that is coming. And we share even now with love that Jesus has brought into the world and the joy that we can have in him. Father, go with us from this service. Lay upon our hearts the great commission that we have. We pray, Father, that you'll help us to be ready to be sent forth into the harvest. We pray that you will indeed send forth laborers into that great harvest. And that if we are the ones to be part of those laborers, Help us to realize it. Help us to be burdened with the call so that we might go forth as your faithful ones have always done to share the good news, share the blessings of the gospel with those who walk in darkness 
and those who do not, do not know the wonderful hope that has been brought into the world through your Son. For we pray it in his blessed name.